thank you so much, guys, not only for going on that trip, taking that step of faith, but um, coming back and giving us a great report. That was really edifying. That was the first time I've heard Josh speak, I think. Um, and Josh leads the Lighthouse Ministry in the middle school. How old are you, Josh? 14. 14 years old. This kid's a future preacher, I'm telling you right now. He's got that. He's got that nice, deep voice for it, too. I don't have that. I wish I did. But he's very well spoken. And I, uh, but I have both of you guys did just a tremendous job. Thank you so much. And keep that on your radar. Um, November, it's possible that you might have a similar experience. It's life-changing to do a short-term trip. I've done it before, and man, it um, gives you a whole different perspective. And that was a takeaway from a third world nation, a number of countries down in South America that I visited. Uh, the poverty of the people, and yet the difference in joy. I, I saw that as well. Uh, the Christians are just happier people with far less. So thank you again. Um, First Peter, uh, I've got a shorter message for you today. We're closing out this book, First Peter 5. And by the way, uh, Caleb and Cindy are back here, and I need to apologize to them, my son and uh, his girlfriend there. I don't know how many of you know, my, my wife keeps telling me this every week since December, like, uh, well, January 1st, I guess, that I, I should be announcing that they're engaged because they, he proposed to her Christmas Eve. And so I'm just now getting around to announcing that from the pulpit, because there are still people surprised, like, oh, they're engaged, I didn't know that. And so my wife said, you need to announce it. So this week I determined to do that, but yes. Yeah. Uh, actually, Christmas Eve, we had a, a service, and um, that night, you know, he had just proposed to her that day, I was like, can I announce it tonight? And he said, no, let's, let's wait till we talk to some other people before you announce it publicly. Uh, and then I just kind of, Assumed everybody probably heard word of mouth, and so and many of you may have known that. For those who didn't, uh, we are very uh, excited and blessed uh, for the two of those, uh, the two of them. Well, First Peter chapter five today. We're closing out this book. We're just going to take one verse today. I'll probably have to come back to this next week. Take the final few verses. I'll do a summary of the book to remind you where we've been over the last year. In First Peter five, and verse ten. Of course, as you see on the screen, the title of the series has been Resilient Living in a Hostile World. Verse 10, after you have suffered for a little while, the God of all grace, who called you to his eternal glory in Christ, will himself perfect, confirm, strengthen, and establish you. To him be dominion forever and ever. Amen. So we're drawing this study to a close, and I will say that Peter by the Spirit of God, has a very unique approach to suffering, never dismissive of the struggle and hardship of suffering. You know, God himself is never dismissive of our trials and our temptations. But from the very beginning, Peter has been approaching suffering from a much higher vantage point. And what we're, we're called to do in this book, essentially, is to raise our horizon, to see beyond the localized space and circumstance of our lives, See, behind the curtain of suffering, you have the sovereign hand of God. Beyond the suffering, you have eternal glory and the end of suffering. So how do we raise our horizon? Well, we have to see it from a higher elevation. Do you know if, they, if you got up in the sky about 40,000 feet and you looked out over the horizon, you would essentially be looking at the future. It wouldn't really be the future, but compared to those who are on the ground, it would be because you'd see the sunrise about 15 minutes before everyone else saw the sunrise. That's a raised horizon, the ability to see further than most can see. And in this world, we have a very limited horizon. You know, our human experience is very limited. But imagine seeing not from 40,000 feet, but from a heaven's vantage point. If you could see your pain and your suffering from heaven's vantage point, you would see how transitory your suffering is. You'd even get a glimpse beyond this life of the end of that suffering. Of glory. So today, we're going to talk a little bit about that concept of, this, we, we call it hope, where you can see beyond the horizon of this life, you can see glory. That's the hope that Peter's been talking about, and so we're going to look at this from another perspective today, and three things that I'm going to focus on, and that is knowing God's character, grace, knowing God's calling, that's glory, and then knowing God's commitment to each and every one of us, and that is good, that he's working these things for our good. So let's start about, or let's start with this first thing. We'll talk about the character of God. You notice here in verse 10, I'll come back to after you have suffered for a little while. Let's just focus here. 
the God of all grace. Why not the God of all comfort? Why not the God of all justice? Because let's face it, in our sufferings, we want comfort. We want justice. But what we really need is God's grace. You know, in Exodus, when Moses requested to see glimpses of God, when the Lord revealed himself to him, what was it that really stood out about, about God? It was the fact that he is the Lord God, merciful and gracious. In Psalm 86, when David is afflicted and needy, he's focused on God's grace, his mercy, his loving kindness, and you see it recurring throughout that psalm. It's a great psalm if you're ever suffering. Because he's, he's crying for the one thing that he needed more than anything. And many of us don't even realize in, in moments of suffering, this is really what we need. We need the grace of God. You notice in verse 10, it's the God of all grace. That there's grace to be found in this world. It belongs first to God. God is the original purveyor of grace. A purveyor is someone who uh, deals in a certain marketplace, has a, a product, a, a niche, if you will. And God's niche is grace. And God has a corner on that market. All the supply is owned by God. And anywhere you see grace, you can trace that grace back to God. But in this marketplace... God isn't selling grace. It's costly, but he's bearing the expense of that, that grace so that he can offer it to us freely. You may have seen the acronym for grace, G-R-A-C-E, God's riches at Christ's expense. He foots the bill for it, and he gives it to us for free. So what is this grace that he gives us? Well, one is our enablement. When Paul was talking about his thorn in the flesh, and by the way, we think of a thorn in the flesh as this little pricker in our finger, but the word I believe that he used for thorn is an impaling stake. So he was having serious trials in his life, a serious infirmity. And what was God's answer? My grace is sufficient for you. It's our enablement. It enables us to endure. We were just singing about God's grace this morning, a number of songs. We didn't coordinate that, but it's very fitting. Amazing grace. Through many dangers, toils, and snares, I have already come. Tis grace that brought me safe thus far, and grace will lead me home. It enables us to get through our suffering in this life. And Peter in the second epistle would encourage us to grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. What does that mean to grow in grace? Well, first you have to understand it's not God's grace growing towards you. It, it can't grow. It's already infinite doesn't get any larger than what it already is. But we can grow in our understanding of God's grace and our apprehension of God's grace. In other words, we learn to tap into it. We can grow in our understanding of the grace perspective on life. Instead of the attitude, and this will radically change your suffering if this attitude is changed, where you go from a person who says, you know, I'm a good person and I don't deserve anything but good in my life. And when wrong comes your way, you feel offended. I didn't deserve that. But if you flip the, the script a little bit and you view it from the, the standpoint of grace, you understand that instead of looking at yourself as I'm a good person who only deserves good things, you look at yourself from the standpoint of God's word where God says that it's nothing to do with good. No, not one. That inherently, by nature, we are bad people and we don't deserve anything good. And if we go through life with that perspective, then whenever good comes our way, whatever good we receive, whether it's the salvation that we have or the blessings that accompany that salvation, it's all by God's grace. And you learn to appreciate the good things in life. And what is the basis of God's grace? Well, of course, it's Christ. Grace and truth came through Jesus Christ, right? When Jesus came into this world, he didn't just come to teach us what grace is. Sure, he taught us. He modeled it in his living. But ultimately, he came to provide a basis upon which God could extend his grace to humanity. The cross is the origin of God's grace. From, 
as far as we as human beings can participate in God's grace. He's always been filled with grace. It's part of his nature, his character. But as far as his dealings with humanity, the cross is the origin. Because you understand that God cannot exercise grace towards fallen humanity without his justice being satisfied. God's justice has to be satisfied before he can extend grace. Where was his justice satisfied? It was at the cross. You've seen the word. It's a long word, and you may not know what it means. Propitiation. When it says he made propitiation for our sins, that word means that he satisfied God's holy demands for the payment of human sin. In other words, the cross is what satisfied God's justice, his holiness, so that now God is free to, to extend his grace to humanity. And the grace that flows from the cross flows in every direction, past, present, future. And I say past because even prior to the cross, God was extending grace. Why? Because the cross was a reality in the heart and mind of God. He was the lamb slain before the foundation of the world. It was as good as done in the eyes of God, so he could even, in, before the cross, he could extend that grace. But it's always been about that satisfaction of his holiness. <coughs> Here's the transaction, 2 Corinthians 5.21. For our sake he made him to be sin, who knew no sin, so that we might become the righteousness of God in him. In other words, God treated Christ like we deserve to be treated, so that God can now deal with us in a way that Jesus deserves to be treated. Do you understand by God's grace, God is treating you as his son deserves to be treated because of this transaction of the cross. Of course, the simplest explanation or definition of grace is just simply unmerited favor, undeserved love. And how essential is it in your suffering for you to acknowledge God's love? Because isn't that what we often feel in the midst of suffering that, boy, God doesn't love me a whole lot right now, the way he's you know, letting all this suffering come into my life, you start to call into question God's loving kindness. But if you understand grace, you understand that his love is unconditional. It has nothing to do with you in your performance. It has nothing to do with your circumstance. It's entirely about God. His love never changes. It's important in our suffering that we know God's character. Secondly, that we know God's calling. Look here in verse 10. <clears throat> For after you've suffered for a little while, the God of all grace who called you to his eternal glory in Christ. We have grace for now, glory for later. We haven't just been called to a grace-filled life, we've been called to eternal life. Look at uh, John 17, hold your place here. I think the best way to explain this by looking at the words of Jesus himself in his high priestly intercessory prayer in verse 20 John 17 20 I do not ask on behalf of these alone but for those who will believe in me through their word. In other words, not just praying for the disciples, but future generations of disciples who would believe based on their word as that word spreads. That's, that, that includes us. That they may all be one, even as you, Father, are in me, and I in you, that they also may be one in us, so that the world may believe that you sent me. The glory which you have given me, I have given to them, that they may be one just as we are one. I in them, you in me, that they may become perfected in unity, so that the world may know that you sent me and love them even as you have loved me. Father, I desire that they also whom you have given me be with me where I am, so that they may see my glory which you have given me, for you love me before the foundation of the world. I want you to notice two things that Jesus connects in that passage. The same things Peter connects here that he pairs up, and that is the idea of being in Christ and the glory to follow. Jesus there prayed to the Father that we as God's people would become one with Christ. That's what it is to be in Christ, to be one with him. And subsequently then, to enjoy 
his glory. So Peter pairs these up as well. And I'll explain more about this idea of being in Christ in just a moment. But if you go back to 1 Peter, go back to chapter 1, we've been looking at this concept of eternity, glory, all the way back in the first few verses of this book. 1 Peter 1, verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his great mercy has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to obtain an inheritance which is imperishable and undefiled and will not fade away, reserved in heaven for you. From the very beginning of this epistle, Peter has been pointing our eyes beyond this life to see the hope that we have. And that eternal glory, by the way, stands in contrast to something earlier there in verse 10, 5, verse 10, after you have suffered for a little while. So this is the contrast being made, the suffering which lasts for a little while, and then eternal glory. Now the NASB here, it focuses on the time element, the way it's translated, and that's, that's good, that's relevant, for a little while. But really, the, the main idea just says a little. We're suffering a little. And the, the, a little part can, can either refer to duration or it can refer to degree. In other words, you're suffering a little versus suffering a lot. If we have the faith to see from a raised horizon, then we understand that compared to eternity, that this life and all the suffering that accompanies this life is just a vapor. It doesn't last very long. 2 Corinthians 4 deals with the subject of degree. So you have duration for a short period of time in comparison to eternity. And now we see the degree of, of that suffering. It says, we do not lose heart. Though our outer nature is wasting away, our inner nature is being renewed day by day. You get this, for this slight Momentary affliction is preparing for us an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison. As we look not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are unseen. For the things which are seen are transient, but the things that are unseen are eternal. He says this is a momentary light affliction. You get this idea of a scale. You know the old-fashioned scale where you've got two sides to it. And you, you, you compare one thing to another as far as their weight. In, in Romans chapter 8, it actually says, I reckon the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. And there Paul says, you know, it's really, it's not even worthy to put them on the same scale. There's such a divide. But should you do so, in 2 Corinthians 4, what you see is you have this weight of glory, which has which got... Uh, which is on one side of the scale, the scale, and then you've got the suffering on the other side. And, and basically what he's saying is that the weight of glory, it, it, it's so heavy that any suffering you endure in this life is so light in comparison. It doesn't even move the scale. And what's interesting is that that suffering works more glory. So what you have to do with this scale where you have the suffering which doesn't, have any weight compared to glory, is you have to take from this side all of this suffering and put it on the other side because it actually adds to the weight of the glory. So there's no comparison. And in that sense, they're not worthy to be compared. As weighty as your suffering is, it is nothing in comparison to the glory that's coming. But the key is right there, we look not at the things which are seen, but the things which are unseen. We have this raised horizon. We're looking from heaven's vantage <coughs> point. No God's character, no God's calling. Finally, no God's commitment. Notice this, verse 10. He has called you to eternal glory in Christ. It says he will himself perfect, confirm, strengthen, establish you. Throughout this epistle, I have stated that suffering for the child of God is never wasted. There's always purpose. There's always value. 
in Psalm 118, the psalmist said, It is good for me that I was afflicted, that I might learn your statutes. In other words, the psalmist saw what we all need to see, and that is there is a curriculum within God's appointed sufferings. Whatever those sufferings are, there's a lesson that God is trying to teach us. We saw last time, uh, the devil is trying to use our suffering to shake our faith, to compromise our loyalty to God, to put us in a state of brokenness. But here we see God's intention is to do the opposite. God's intention is to make us stronger, to complete us, that's the idea of perfect, to make us whole, to establish us, give us a firm foundation, a firm footing. We've summarized this thought many times in Romans 8, 28, God works all things together for good to those who love God are called according to his purpose. This is God's commitment, that he will take suffering and he will work it for our good. But there's one thing in this verse that encourages me above probably anything else that personalizes this promise, this commitment. It's one word. Don't ever pass over this word lightly. It says he will himself perfect, confirm, strength, and establish you. Himself. You know that God has a, a host of angels that serve him. They do his bidding. And it's true that, that angels do have some part in our care as God's people. But there are certain things that God doesn't delegate to the angels. The angels aren't sovereign. They can't orchestrate circumstances in your life. They're not all-knowing. God may use the angels to bring about different circumstances, but in the ultimate sense, it's God himself who is in the business of working out your suffering for good. I thought of 1 Thessalonians 4. And this is a verse on the rapture event when Jesus comes back for his bride. You know, that's, that's an event where he could have delegated it to the angels to become chaperones, to come get us and take us back to him. But it, look at what it says. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven. He will personally attend to this matter because when it comes to God's people, God's children, there are certain things that God will never delegate. What this means for us in the midst of our suffering, whatever crucible we find ourselves in, is you can be sure that God is the one who personally has his hand on the thermostat. And he knows just how hot your, your trial can be to where it will continue to be of good to you and not break you, not crush you. God is not in the business of taking us past our boiling point, if you will. And our tolerance for heat trials is different, each and every one of us. So God's personally attending to your life and to my life and our sufferings. Well, in closing, I just want to touch on this final point. This is the application, and that is know God's condition. Peter is extending the hope of glory He's instructing us that the sufferings of our lives, the suffering is working for us, not against us. There are two words that will guarantee that your suffering is never wasted. And this is his condition. And that's back here uh, in verse 10, midway through the verse there, who called you to his eternal glory in Christ. Those two words, in Christ. That's his condition. I wish I could say that no suffering in this world will ever be wasted. But unfortunately, I don't believe that's true. Suffering apart from a relationship with Christ is a suffering that will never reach this uh, appropriate destination of bringing glory to God. You might say that it's wasted. The condition is that we have to be in Christ. What does that mean to be in Christ? Well, it speaks to a person's identity. It means not just that a person is a believer in Jesus, but subsequently, because they're a believer in Jesus, they have this new position, this new placement into Jesus Christ. 
where we literally share in the life of Christ. We become one with him. That, uh, that position, it defines not only who we are, but in Christ, it also defines what we possess. To put it plainly, we have everything Jesus has because we are one with him. It's a package deal. We are inseparably tied to the life of Jesus Christ. We mirror his life in many ways so that in his earthly life, Jesus suffered. So guess what? Those of us who are attached to Jesus Christ, we're one with Christ, we're going to suffer in this world as well. We're going to take up our cross. We're going to follow him. We find that Jesus' suffering facilitated great purpose. And we found throughout this epistle that our suffering facilitates purpose. It's not wasted. Jesus' suffering ended in glory. And that's the promise for us. Because we're attached to Jesus, we're one with him, we can be sure that our suffering will end in glory as well. See, whether you're whether or not you're in Christ, that determines your relationship to suffering. Outside of Christ, there's only suffering. And there isn't a promise to you if you're outside Christ that someday your suffering will end and you'll experience glory. It's quite the contrary. For those who are outside of Christ, your suffering doesn't end beyond this life. It increases. It's eternal. Jesus talked about hell more than he talked about heaven, I believe, to warn people that there is a real place of suffering. He said, well, I don't want to go there. I want to be in glory. I want to be with the Lord. Well, how can I change my condition? The answer is you can't change your condition, but the God of all grace can. You have to meet his grace at the point of origin. And that's the cross. Jesus' suffering was purposed to save you from an eternity of suffering. There was a great expense that was paid for your salvation, for your redemption. And he paid it in full. That's what the words it is finished means. Paid in full. Everything that was necessary for your salvation has already been done. And so all God asks is that you take him at his word. Do you acknowledge that you're a sinner, that you need a savior? And acknowledge that Jesus paid the price for those sins at the cross. He took your place. He became sin for us that we could become the righteousness of God in him. And I'll just close with this verse. Many of you know well, Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, for by grace are you saved through faith, that not of yourselves, it's a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Salvation is wholly a work of God's grace. And I would encourage you today, if you're suffering in this world and your suffering doesn't make sense and you think that it, it's for nothing, and maybe it is for nothing at this point in your life. It doesn't have value until you know Jesus. But once you know Jesus, God promises that he himself will attend to your circumstance to make sure that everything that comes into your life will work together for your good. And all it requires is that you take God at his word, that he loves you, that he died for you. Jesus rose again. He's in heaven now, extending his hand. Come unto me, all you that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. If you're heavy in this life, you can come to Jesus. Accept the gift of his grace. Accept his eternal salvation by just believing and expressing that to God. God, I believe that Jesus died for my sins and rose again. I'm taking Jesus as my own personal Savior. That's the simplicity of it. And that's grace. Lord, we are so grateful this morning to be gathered here and to be the recipients of your grace. We sung about it this morning. Amazing grace. Lord, I would ask as your people that we would understand the principles of grace that, that shape our lives. Apart from your grace, Father, we, we have no hope. There's no meaning, no purpose, no value in life apart from that grace. Thank you, Lord, for freely lavishing us with that grace through Jesus Christ, through his sacrifice. But help us to learn to appropriate that enablement 
to tap into your love, to live under the awareness of your unconditional love for us, that you look upon us with favor, acceptance, not because we're good people, not because we deserve it, but because Jesus paid the price so that you can treat us as you treat your own son. I just ask, Father, if there's anyone here suffering today, and I know there are uh, those among us uh, that have dealt with recent trials and with the Jordan family right now, dealing with um, the suffering of his brother John. And Lord, I just pray for that situation specifically, a man who's passing into eternity, who's living right now the very thing we're talking about, beyond the suffering, there's glory. He's in his final stages of suffering, and I pray, Father, for the alleviation of the pain. You would fill his heart only with peace and joy and anticipation, and soon he will open his eyes to see you face to face. And Lord, we, each and every one of us, look forward to that day for ourselves when we will be with you in glory. Thank you again for that living hope in Jesus Christ. Amen. Thanks so much for being here this week. Next week, as I said, we'll wrap up this book, um, and then we'll start a new study after that. But thank you so much, and thanks again to Maria and Josh for sharing with us. Lord bless you guys. Have a great week.